kind of easy narrative many leaders are going with is the blame narrative. Who did it? Who started it? And that narrative goes into, well, let's find the culprit and do bad articles about them or arrest them or sue them. Welcome to this, the fourth installment of my Tough Minds and Tender Hearts and Steady Hand series to distill wisdom in the midst and mists of the corona pandemic. One of my good friends from Australia, Russell Clements, introduced me to his PhD supervisor and friend, Professor Sohail Inyatula, who has impressed him as somebody who embodies those three qualities. Sahail is an eminent international futurist and political scientist, born in Pakistan, raised in the United States, and now living in Brisbane, Australia. He is currently the Chair in Future Studies at UNESCO, an adjunct professor at the University of Melbourne Business School, and host of an educational think tank, Meta Futures. Together with his co-host, Dr. Ivana Maleshevik, they explore alternative and preferred futures and the world views and myths that underlie them so that they can become ever more protagonists of their own narratives. So Hale recently co-authored a paper with another foresight practitioner, Dr. Peter Black, who is also a tough-minded person, but specializing in veterinary epidemiology and is an expert advisor with extensive experience in addressing emerging infectious disease threats within the biosecurity field. And we are calling this first part COVID-19 Futures, where Sohail will explain the four futures that he and his colleagues have been articulating. Part two will be a 20 minute segment looking back into the past, focused on the macro history mainly of South Africa. But that will allow me to just speak from my own micro history within the context of South Africa's traumas and transformation. Part three brings us back into the here and now, down to earth again, where we will be wrapping things up, giving some resources, stuff for future study, so that when we all emerge from lockdown, we are all primed and ready to act effectively and to try and be the difference makes a difference. Well, I believe you in lockdown in Brisbane. Thank you for your time, and how's it going? Yes, exercise is allowed, uh, but that's about it. Exercise, getting food, but in general, yes, it's uh, hammer and dance is the story. Social and distancing, stay at home, don't get infected, don't infect anyone, keep it tight. Well, in my last conversation in this series, I metaphorically likened the COVID-19 virus as an explosion on spaceship Earth that was imperiling the lives of the crew, the human species, I sent out a distress signal to a good friend who happens to live in Houston, Dr. Yvonne Cruz, using that famous line from Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. It's brilliant. How does that core metaphor work for you in making sense? The way I've tried to look at it is, 12 years ago during the global financial crisis, Financial Times had a great article. They're saying a crisis in search of a narrative. And, and they were like, well, what is this really? Is it a mortgage crisis? Is it a banking crisis? Is it a deeper financial crisis of the entire system? Is it a crisis of savings? Is this a crisis of capitalism? Mm -hmm. And they said, depending on the narrative you use, you, of course, get a different strategy. Yeah. The conclusion at that time was, we need to save Wall Street, not Main Street. So it was a mortgage crisis that could become a banking crisis. Let's enhance liquidity. Let's save the banks and ensure money flows at the top levels. So that was the conclusion. And now those of us who follow change can see, well, 
they solved the problem in the short term, but that led to deeper inequity. So the solutions, the stories we use, in fact, have short-term, medium-term, long-term implications. So in your example, you went for the grandest narrative. <laughs> the kind of easy narrative many leaders are going with is the blame narrative. Who did it? Who started it? And that narrative goes into, well, let's find the culprit and do bad articles about them or arrest them or sue them. The next level is kind of the disease narrative. Here's the disease, find the cure, find the vaccine, solved. And then as we go deeper, well, that solves today, but if the causation is deeper, what about the next zoonotic disease? Is it the wet markets? Is it our meat, industrial meat production? So then we're going further, well, I don't want to just solve today's problem, I can already see this will lead to problems for the next disease, five, 10, 15 years. So let's use this as you're suggesting as a way to rethink how we do things. But then if it's, if it's a zoonotic issue, then we go further, well then, really this is challenging everything. And then you've gone to climate change. Because climate change will even create more pandemics, more diseases. So instead of just solving this as a blame game or solving this as a medical cure, this should be that wake up call, how do we rethink what we do? And that kind of leads to, I think, where you were going to, this needs to be at a global renaissance. So the example I used, the European renaissance was about challenging dogma. Here's how we saw things. Whether they're true or not, they no longer work. The Asian renaissance has been, here's how we see life, and it doesn't work. We have to have this inner world. So if you put those together, challenging official dogmas, how things are, in our own inner spiritual life, then you start to talk about, I think where you were going, this Gaian kind of transformation. William Norman Thompson called that the kind of a Gaian polity. And so that's really, if you want to go the deepest, the most long-term, the most transformational part of it, this is where you go. If that's all too much, then simple blame someone or find the cure and we're all, all okay in one or two years. Mm-hmm. So this is where the narrative informs the strategy we use. So our work in futures is less to say who's wrong or right in the narrative, but every narrative has a price. Every narrative has a conclusion. Every narrative leads to a new strategy. Mm. So this is kind of you close it or you open it, and I think you've opened it fantastically. Houston, we have a problem. This planet has a problem. Let's not just solve COVID-19. Let's think through what we eat, how we consume, and what type of world system do we want. Thanks, Sahel. Can you now just explain overall the four scenarios that you and your colleagues have outlined, please? So I just did a textual analysis, pretty much read everything I could. And four things jumped out. First was a zombie apocalypse. And you might say that's the feeling future. People feel panicky, feel afraid. Uh, illness is coming. You can't, it's, it's not like a war. It's, it's everywhere. So that was scenario one, fear, let's collect toilet paper or collect pasta. In Australia, there was this weird grabbing stuff and running home. So this is scenario one, is the zombie apocalypse. Scenario two is this is the pause. So there's a virus, we can't do what we did before. We pause this year, next year we speed up. So the financial markets have adopted that one. So that's why they're not in deep panic or tanking. There's this exogenous event, This year will be tough. There will be a recession everywhere, but it hasn't changed. Liquidity hasn't changed the long-term profits. Scenario three is, well, let's not pause to speed up. Let's pause to transform. So we don't go after this business as usual. Maybe there's things we're doing today that we don't need to do. Personally, for me, I'm thinking, well, I was traveling maybe too much. So how do I reduce that? I was doing too much. How do I reduce that? The work of Hal and Sidra Stone talks about money cells. They call it the pusher self, always pushing, achieving, achieving. So we have a collective pusher self, pushing against nature, pushing against others, always trying to expand this manifest destiny. And this is saying, well, now you've reached the limit. So this is saying, slow down to change the game the next few years. And that goes into... How do we treat nature? How do we treat others? How do we treat self? 
how do I take some of the good things about this time and keep them going the next 5, 10, 15 years? Now, scenario four started out for me as the great malaise that we never find a cure. And this becomes the seven, 10 year depression emotionally and financially. But now watching, I've started to see this more as this is the back and forth. This is a zone. Some parts figure it out. They eradicate. New Zealand has claimed now they've eradicated. So they'll allow travel there from other places in like a green zone. Mm. So if you look at the war against Iraq, eventually they became green zones where it's safe to go. The work I was doing with Interpol, we were having a conversation about Interpol's futures. We said, well, there's a green, here are the green zone things we can do. Red zones, danger coming. Orange zone, here's a warning. Then ultraviolet zone, how do we use this event to start to think through our futures? This fourth scenario is, in a way, there's no solution. And that's even more difficult for people. So when I looked at those four, that was pretty much what I've seen in the last month I've not seen any shift from that. Those are the four big images, the big pictures we're seeing. And almost on cue, just when I was getting so inspired and enthusiastic about that wonderful vision of a transnational partnership with the World Health Organization having now more teeth, President Donald Trump suspended funding for WHO. Is the global health awakening scenario now off the table? Have things lurched towards the likelihood of a great despair or worse? <laughs> I know in our foresight, work, what we've seen is how do I get a prime minister or a minister or a mayor to take some of these challenges seriously? I remember one workshop I was running for 15 councillors. At the end of it, one of the councillors came up to me and said, you don't quite understand. We don't care. We're here to get reelected. Our business is re-election. Our business is not changing the world. Mm -hmm. And this became uh, unsettling. And I thought, okay, here's a brutal reality. They play politics to win. We understand politics as the ability to create new futures as agency. So that how do I get them to see that the long term can help them with short term victories? That if they create a better world, they'll do better. And this is one of the big tensions. I know the former head of the European Union, when he was talking about uh, climate change, he said, we know what the right thing to do is. We're unconvinced that we can get reelected on the right thing. So this becomes part of the tension. So like you, I'm an admirer of international organizations. I've not worked in them, but done endless speeches and foresight seminars with them. And my conclusion is similar to yours. If the challenge is planetary, the solution can really not be national, nor can it be international. So I would like to see a WHO with teeth. So we know weapons inspectors have teeth. They can say, look, we found these weapons in your country. They've been banned. You can't have them. So I would prefer a WHO with greater superordinate authority. Now I can see individualistic, laissez-faire gang, this is frightening for them like anything. What do you mean? They're going to have power over me. So this is part of the big battle we're going to face because many of the decisions I make or you make, if they hurt others, should they be allowed? Mm. And this is the global tension we're seeing. We can see in East Asia, there's a different view of what counts as the self. It's more collective. Mm. And I can see in South Africa and Africa, you've talked about Ubuntu saying, well, yes, it's me, but I exist in a community. I don't want to be causing ill health to others. So Ubuntu, if you have a spiritual feeling, that's beautiful. But when you don't, what powers do we give to global organizations to make sure we don't destroy nature, we don't engage in activities that lead to global pandemics? Because like you, this is pandemic you know, 3.0, right? Mm. Uh, SARS, Ebola, however you want to call them, this is quite more serious. And the next one, of course, all of us know could be even worse. So this is getting that global framework. The discussion I had with the Interpol gang was, well, look, Interpol is merely a meeting place for national leaders. That's not enough. You need an earth pole. Ethical police, forward-looking, who are looking, okay. We, I mean, when we're looking at crime statistics, this is the best time ever for organized crime. Mm. So when I give speeches, they ask me, what should young people do? I said, well, you should join organized crime. I mean... <laughs> 
<laughs> agile, adaptable, flexible, thinking ahead, seeing how cybercrime is growing. So both you and I, we don't want the world where the best career for a young person is organized crime. So how do we do something else? Clearly, it's what you were saying. Yes, big organizations can be bureaucratic. Yes, they're always be over their nation state leaders. We want something else. And I think, as you said, Houston, we have a problem. That something else means a global solution. Welcome to part two of my conversation with Professor Sohail Inyatullah. So what has this musical montage got to do with the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, the drone footage is of the beautiful Ponderland wild coast of South Africa. Over the past 20 years, this is where I go for re-enchantment with the universe. In my book, I describe it as a coastline in Africa that unmasks the soul. Since I can't do my annual pilgrimage walk along the wild coast in body, putting this musical montage together has at least helped me return there in my mind and imagination. For it was 20 years ago that I took my family here on an Amadiba adventure, a horse and hiking trail hosted by the local Amadiba indigenous community. We felt we had stumbled into paradise. The indigenous coastal community who hosted us invited us back to support them to shape their own narrative future, to promote ecotourism development that would achieve what the South African constitution in fact obliges, to promote the quality of life and unlock human potential for all citizens. I am deeply grateful to all who have made creative contributions to the shared work of restoring equilibrium and equanimity between nature, humanity and technology. Thanks to Jimmy Reynolds and Gordon Grease for the stunning drone cam footage and to Cheryl Alexander, a wild awake photographer from Vancouver for some of the still images. Thanks to Claire Johnston of Mango Groove for giving me the beautiful music. Appropriately, this track is titled Jamila Jadida, which in Swahili means a beautiful life. It is from an album titled Star Away, an African Dream, that she and Jeff Malaleke produced specifically to support environmentalists to communicate their message in inspirational ways. Frank Tucson helped me with sound engineering and mixing Special thanks to Charmaine Seville from Melbourne for the beautiful artwork created to illustrate Sir Hale's future scenarios and to Marguerite Kutsia from Cape Town for supplementary images. Also thanks to Zapiro and other cartoonists whose work I have used for the B-roll to enhance the visual experience. <laughs> Although President Nelson Mandela was a strong advocate of getting his cabinet behind a scenario building process, which articulated a flight of the flamingos option, among others, but that was the preferred future because it envisaged a slow, gradual, collective ascent to a just and equitable society and an ever-strengthening economy. But two decades later, there's a mood of some disillusionment. Um, some of his former cabinet colleagues, like Ronnie Castrells, say that the whole exercise was a bit manipulative, 
geared to a particular more neoliberal ideological view of the world. Now, as I've looked into your causal layered analysis framework, it does seem to me to be more open and more rigorous as a systems approach. So maybe if you can just explain how you go about it, and is it able to better transcend the binaries and the divisions for today that we now face in our highly polarized world? So CLA suggests four levels of analysis. One is the data, the listening. Here's our most people. There's a problem. We look at the problem, right? Let's solve the problem, right? So there's traffic. Let's just build more roads, right? That's, that's kind of level one analysis. Level two, why is there traffic congestion? Then you start to think, well, is it that we're city design? Well, let's rethink city design. How do I do integrated planning? Car to bicycle to walking, green spaces. Then we go deeper. Well, maybe it's not just integrated planning. It's a worldview issue. The worldview issue is, in fact, car-centric, me and my car. So if that's the worldview, then it doesn't matter. Then we're going to keep on with the same problem. So then we go deeper. And the kind of the metaphor is I love my car because car represents freedom. So it's like the mind of the teenager of the 18 year old runs the planet. Now, if you're okay with that, fantastic. But most mayors I meet, most cities I meet, most governors say, well, actually, the car has become our problem. <laughs> so then you think, okay, what's the solution? Well, I love my community. Then what's the worldview from car centric to community people centric? then you're not talking about just the car, you're talking about mobility. So then how do I create mobility? Then I go back to systems analysis. Mm -hmm. So what would a mobile community look like? Well, then I want to integrate and create driverless cars. I want to have green pathways. So now I'm designing for mobility. Then I measure what's my measure of success. Speed was a measure of success health. So now infrastructure planning becomes a national health issue. So CLA starts with the problem, what the systemic causes, worldview causes, what's the deep narrative, then we change the story and come up with a new systemic solution. And now this can be unsettling for people who live at level one, level two, right? Just show me the data. Okay. So stage one is the problem, say it's congestion. At level one, then people have the obvious solution, build more roads. Stage two, well, actually, what's causing the congestion? It could be more roads, more cars. Then they talk about integrated infrastructure planning. Stage three is the world view of what's behind that. It's often car-centric, ownership-centric. What's behind that? I love my car because car represents freedom. So as you go deeper, you find the core issue, which is often a narrative, a story. So then our goal is to transform it. The one country my partner was working with, they went to that level, they said, okay. Then they asked themselves, well, who uses cars? They want to create a more public system. And they realized the migrants use the buses. So they said, okay, there's no need to do this. Because mm -hmm. they didn't. Mm -hmm. So this is where you go deeper. So the alternative solution, I love my car to I love my community. If I love my community, I change the worldview from car centric to mobility centric. So one country we're working with, they said, let's change our narrative to car is king to everything within reach. Yeah. Now, if your narrative is everything within reach, then where do you put your money? Clearly it's internet. Mm. It's not, clearly it's mobility. So the story changes the national strategy. Then you have to measure it. If my old measurement was number of accidents, congestion, my new measurement could be, well, how healthy are citizens? Are they walking enough? <laughs> I'm chuckling. You chose this to illustrate the methodology by looking at cars and road building because the other big fight we've had on in South Africa with civil society in the state is with the South African National Roads Agency, SANREL. For the past 20 or so years, civil society and the royal family of the Amampondo, a traditional community, a kingship from the Eastern Cape, have found themselves now in the post-liberation era having to do battle with 
a state-owned entity who has plans to reroute the national road between KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape right along the wild coast. As I explained to you earlier about the mining. Well, this is very much in the same community and it's threatening both the indigenous culture and the resplendent biodiversity. I mean, the wild coast is a biodiversity hotspot. It's not the sort of place which in our very environmentally stressed society that we should be going about building mega bridges and spanning deep gorges and increasing the environmental footprint so that people can travel faster. Now, Sahel, I'm, I'm not trying to recruit you to my cause as an activist. In fact, I see the potential of your alternative and preferred futures methodology to bring all the stakeholders together, find common ground, so that we can try and find a shared narrative. Because, I mean, then Sanral are not only in trouble in the Wild Coast and the Eastern Cape, also in the Gauteng area, in between Johannesburg and Pretoria, they're wanting to put e-tolls on all the major highways and public, and motor publics up in arms about it. And the system has actually now failed because of a lack of legitimacy of the state and the larger political context of state capture. Well, this is relevant in the COVID-19 context because just as the 2008 financial crisis caused other large state infrastructure projects to be shelved because they were no longer economically feasible, I can't see Sanral prevailing with its current plans given this new normal that we face in the future, particularly on the wild coast. It's going to require an engagement and a transcending of the hostilities. My own analysis of the whole scheme has been that it's really now become, unfortunately, too big to fail in the minds of the planners. And it so often happens with such situations. That's when they become diabolical. Now, my question in that whole narrative is simply to so how does your methodology work to help get all stakeholders on board, particularly where there's been polarization and division? How do we build sufficient trust for that to happen? So these are always challenging and we do the best we can. In your language, I think what you're agreeing with, it's almost like a hungry ghost. Right? <laughs> it can't stop. I must have more. I must have extract more. Yeah. And in that situation, what do you do? So clearly for me, our projects work better when there's a minister or prime minister or CEO who says, look, I can see the limitations of my model. That I'm going to have more roads and I'm going to endanger nature and I'm going to endanger my community. So it looks like I win over long term, I lose. Please help me. Now, if we have an enlightened leader, it's much better. If we don't, then it's getting them to see, here's the narrative of the other. The people you're fighting against, they also have a story. Listen to their story. Then we do something, conflict uh, resolution futures. My partner, Ivana Milovic, she writes on that. So you have two different visions. Each has a narrative. Then you start to find out, oh, there's some win-win solutions. Mm. And that training is conflict resolution. Many people don't have. It's like, well, it's, you know, highway or no way my way or, or no way. And then you think, okay, that's story one. What's story two? Well, we all live in the village. What's story three? So you want to move them a bit from they have the answer to the opposition has some answers too. Mm -hmm. So many groups I've worked with, and when I say, why hasn't it worked? Well, they say, they give me the official systemic reasons. Mm -hmm. We didn't have funding. Boston like the project. Board, this board sucks. So like, okay, we get all that. Now why hasn't it worked? And it often comes down to we had a metaphor of ourselves that we knew everything. So if you look at Microsoft, I wasn't part of this project. They were interviewed, the CEO, and said, how have you created $80 billion in value? He said, I went from the story of we know it all to we're all curious learners. I changed the company story. Then I hired different people. As I hired different people, our business model changed. So in business, once you're confronted with failure, they have to change. In large organizations that are confronted with people who think differently, 
they are used to try to bulldoze. Mm -hmm. So they succeed, but they fail because they need those people. When we were working with the future of disability in Australia, it was a fantastic conference. We were lucky the minister had understood inclusion was first. So we had 550 people, every area of disability was in the room, and we tried to create a shared vision. So we did the scenario work, we did the metaphor work, and we said, here's how we can go forward. So, Hal, you spent time in Hawaii. Uh, you did your PhD there, apparently, at the university, and you worked very much within the judicial system. Please tell us a bit about that experience. To put a context to it, and staying with the narrative of South Africa's own mega history and the constitution, thank goodness we've had the separation of powers because it has been the judiciary that has enabled us to pull us back from, you know, from the abyss of falling into state capture and failed state because of an executive that's become you know, fundamentally corrupted and a legislature that has really just become very divided and inept. And uh, we're going to need to see the executive come to the party. In the early stages of this COVID-19 saga, we were very excited to see that President Ramaphosa was grasping the imperative, was listening to the scientists, but now we seem to be a bit of playing the hammer and dance in South Africa. And even one of the senior judges has gone on Facebook recently to question the rationality of some of the measures that President Ramaphosa's executive are now enforcing in this lockdown. And I can foresee another further recourse to the courts. So back to having to go to the judiciary to try and deal with conflict. And it, it's not sustainable. Even my boss in the IEC, he was a judge, Judge Johann Krichler, who's now retired, he served his term in the Constitutional Court. He was concerned about the over of society and we can't just rely on the courts. What does your experience in that early phase of your career, what lessons have you learned that might be relevant this is for the benefit of all my lawyer friends and maybe some of the judges who get to see this interview. I mean, at the meta level, clearly, we all agree, once you have an independent judiciary, you have a better society. I mean, really, this federalist model of governance is brilliant. There's executive, parliament, and independent judiciary. Once we don't have that, people don't feel trust or safe. So that has to be at every level. When I've worked with spiritual organizations where everyone's inspired, loves, loves each other, they hug, they have an amazing vision, but they've not built in an independent conflict resolution system. So this is the other part of Futures Work. Futures Work, we do scenarios, we look at disruptions. But one of the most important things is what you've entered at, we understand macro history. So I have a series, a trilogy of books on macro history and putting it into a few sentences, we look at grand patterns. Grand pattern one is decline. Ibn Khaldun said he's a champion, a founder, over three, four generations, decline is guaranteed. The founder has the vision, the person after the founder, they're the companions. They were with the founder, they've lost the charisma. They're now going by the text. But third generation, they're seduced by corruption. And now they've gone from the founder's inclusion to my tribe. And generation four comes in and just says, show me the money. So this is called Lewin's decline. And we can see that generationally. Now at the end of that, Khaldun says, yeah, but then a different group has been outside of power. They come in and say, wait, let's go back and revisit the purity of thought. In South Africa's case, it looks like that's come because of this crisis. Mm. So the tribe has disappeared, hearing you to this collective, which is stunningly good. And the second pattern, which was the response, is what if it's a pendulum? So when we start projects, it's extreme green. And everyone says, great, we're going to be green, inclusive, fantastic. And I can straight away say, yeah, in seven years, you're going to be right-wing and exclusive. And they go, no, you won't. I say, well, yeah, but... Sorokin's pendulum works that way. What you're good at, 
you disown, you push away, the opposite happens. Now, once you've built in the opposite in your strategy, then you can see, aha, this is going to be our tendency. Let's have an independent judiciary. Let's have conflict resolution built in. And the third pattern is linear. Every generation gets better, is healthier, wealthier, wiser. That's what we're all hoping for. But all of us understand these pendulums. So then that creates a spiral. How do we create a spiral that looks at the charismatic breakthrough, understands decline, and still is progressive? That keeps the spiritual part with the technological part. So there's the macro historical part here. I know that's away from what you're saying about judiciaries, but when we were with the justice system in Hawaii, they were asking, how do we meet the changing needs of our citizens? That yes, we're the third branch, but we also need to be adaptive and flexible. So often we found out of that project, 32 American states adopted our foresight model. And so they start to think, okay, the judiciary has a chance to think of the long term. The executive doesn't. So we're not there to tell the executive what to do, but we can start to look at the next 10, 20, 30 years and become more wisdom based. So that was a very exciting project to think, well, maybe we're always trying to get the executive to do foresight, to get the parliament to do foresight, but perhaps the natural home of futures is in the court system. They're precedence based, but they have time to look at what are the problems we're gonna face in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And let's build in conflict resolution methods to actually address those now. We stole a long way from the true integration of those four scenario domains that you identify of spirit, nature, economics, and society within South African society, particularly in the mining industry. And if I may mention, it's partly not been helped because of certain Australian mining entrepreneur who has sought to take advantage of our situation. The conflict resolution process that the judiciary provides is adversarially based. You have a winner and a loser. And in my career, I've been privileged to work closely with lawyers, and I don't want to take anything away from the extraordinary work that they've done in holding the mining industry more accountable. Uh, Richard Spur has now become somewhat famous. I've been privileged to work very closely with him. And at the same time, I argue this point with him as well. One can use the law to force people to submit, but it's a pretty blunt instrument if one needs to get people to really cooperate. Now, that's a lesson those of us who our parents learn when our children reach teenager level. We've got to inspire rather than use force and power over them. So it's often when the power over strategy is over and there's a winner and a loser, well, that's when social workers get called in to try and help the losers pick up the pieces to create insight and to move on. Any thoughts about what we can do? Um, well, it's very clear looking at, uh, if you look at Johan Galtung's work, right? The more alternatives, the more likely there's a peaceful solution. So this is building in futures literacy the ability to think in terms of scenarios for five-year-olds. So they grow up with the ability to think it's not either or, there's a whole range of possibilities. So people straight away go from zero, everything is okay, to five, the world is ending. What about two, things are getting better. So there's one, two, three, four, five possibilities. So this is developing the future's literacy, conflict resolution ability with young children, all the way through. So if you look at, mar at marriages, right? Fight everyone, everything's gone to hell. Instead of, okay, let's look through alternative futures. Scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. When my kids were young, I mean, they're tired of scenarios now. They've heard this too much. When they say, Dad, well, what should we do next in our lives? They're older. 
So let's do a scenario workshop. They go, no, please, no more scenario workshops. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're both quite brilliant. And I'm looking back at the thing I'm happy we did with them when they were small. I remember once they were fighting over a teddy bear or something. Mm-hmm. And it was like, dad, do something. And quickly I ran a future scenario workshop, <laughs> you know, which That's is one of the solutions. Is it get a new teddy bear? Is it share the teddy bear? Is it rip it in half? Is it what's the real problem here? So this is the type of conflict resolution methodology we want to build into futures thinking and, and every society. Once you have that, the likelihood is people uh, will do better. So what you said with the infrastructure company, they're bulldozers. So that's obviously not working. They're not doing conflict resolution. They're saying it's their way. Now, sometimes it's okay to have one solution. We understand that there's a threat. Someone's you know, trying to attack you. You don't do a conflict resolution workshop. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm getting out of here. Call the police. But in many cases, you actually want to create community and go over and over. But that assumes authenticity, assumes a willingness to dialogue. Mm. That has to be there. If that's there, the rest is possible. If it's not there, then all the scenario work won't work. Then it's just a will to power. At the end of your interview with Mena von Duren, which is on YouTube, which I'll give people the link, you ended by explaining why you see psychotherapy as a prerequisite for becoming a futurist. Well, I took that to mean that that's where the spiritual domain comes in. And in that sense, it's not just about therapy. It's about heightened self-awareness. It's about humility. It's about meditation. Now, but you know, in Western postmodern society, they tend to be uncomfortable with those who try and collapse uh, the bifurcation between the public world of facts, where science and law want objective empirical evidence for truth claims, and the private world of values, where matters of personal subjective belief and faith are the criterion for truth. How do you personally, as a futurist, transcend that binary and that dichotomy in your own professional work? Everyone has a different narrative or story they have to use, right? So I know in our futures work, we say be epistemologically clean. So if I'm saying, here's the future I want, here's the scenarios, who who am I in that process? Mm. So the traditional modernist world was, it's a lever, I'm lifting the planet, I'm outside the process. Mm. Mm. And that's good scientific methodology, and we appreciate that, we honor that, that's important. At the same time, we're both very clear, we're in this process. Good science, when it moves to policy communication, has to be, here's my story in this. Mm. So scientists, this person with a lab coat, and now, of course, scientists is hero these days. So this transitions is important. In my own case, the spirituality is idealism, this Gaian love, and then the opposite, of course, all of us have to live with our opposite selves. So in foresight work, we call it the disowned self, the disowned future. I remember one workshop I was running, everyone imagined this green, gender equitable, spiritual city. I said, that's fantastic. I want to live there. I'm going to feel safe there. I want to feel welcome there. I'll feel at home there. And then we asked scenario two, I said, what's being disowned? What do we push away? And people said, nothing. This is the best future. But let me ask again, what can't we see? And these two engineers in the back of the room said, none of you can see power. You all want a green, spiritual, open, inclusive society. Cities are run by access to capital and who gets the ability to build building buildings and who makes money. That's what cities are about. And then there was this tension in the room and tension in all of us. What parts of us are spiritual? What parts of us understand conflict and tension? Then we said, okay, what's scenario three? And they were clever. They said, aha, for us to make this work green, spiritual, has to link with capital. We don't want huge capital, but we have to make the economic case. And so that became a very powerful way. How do I integrate the preferred, which can be very idealistic, the disown, which can be brutal, with this third space. So in terms of my life, it's been about that. Here's a vision I have about the planet, global governance, post-meet, Guyan polity, a very different type of world. And I can see, well, that pushes away many things. 
So I had hope with post-structuralism, pluralism would lead to a better world. What I didn't understand, pluralism would become a weapon for the will to power to actually create a worse world. <laughs> and if you'll permit me to take another one of my hobby horses out of the stable and give it a gallop. I spent much of my life and career, in the apartheid era and now latterly in the last 20 years, trying to speak truth to power. It's felt a bit like banging my head against a wall. So I've stepped back and thought, well, let's be more strategic. Let's not so simply talk about speaking truth to power. Let's understand the nature of power. So I now talk more about speaking truth about power to try and promote insight how power works as an intoxicant. That, and the evidence is there, that over time leads to what Lord David Owen has written about, the hubris syndrome, where there's a change of personality, where leaders lose touch with reality and become reckless, highly narcissistic, and frankly, very dangerous and unfit to hold office. Except getting them out has proved difficult, even within evolved Western democracies like the USA, because of the partisanship and the perpetual mutual scapegoating that tends to occur. In your causal layered analysis, how do you reckon with the reality of power? Because I'd like to see what potential it offers as a means of being more skillful in helping organizations transform and deal with the elephant in the room, which is who holds power. I'm saying this in the context of also reading the work of a really inspirational person, a fellow social worker, Brené Brown, who, who does maintain quite strongly that the power over era has long passed that the future belongs in the 21st century now going forward to those who seek to find their power with each other. Well, <laughs> as much as I really do still believe that is true, the harsh reality of the world we live in and some of my own battle scars of having spoken truth to power and even trying to speak truth about power, do you have any guidance for me on that front? I mean, I agree with you, but there's citizens. So this is where when you have so much pluralism, part of that is people go to dark spaces, right? Uh, going into positions where conspiracy theorists, these alternative views of reality, they become quite challenging. So in terms of power, I would very much agree with you. Let's figure out power over myself. Mm. Understand how power works in the external world understand how power works in the economic world. So if you're a spiritual person, it's understanding here's how power works. When do you use the stick? When do you hold your own power? It's not always just hugs. From a scientific world is saying, well, okay, I'm a scientist. I need to be able to communicate. Here's what I know, my authority. At the same time, we've gone from experts know everything to anyone on the street knowing everything. And now we're trying to figure out this third space. The non-experts have a role, but experts also have a role. So this is kind of this liminal transitional phase we're in. And like you, I mean, we're searching what's next. How do we create these new governance structures of the self and governance structures in the external world? And I wish I had an easy answer for you there. I'm, you know, struggling with it myself, trying to figure out how do I, do I attend to those who are in conspiracy world? Or do I say, no, they're in their planet. Let me focus on the world I want. And more and more, my lesson has been, let me look at my anger, my frustration, focus my word, focus my actions. Here's the future I want. I'm going to co-create that and find people who want to move in that direction. The mm -hmm. low road gang can go the low road way. That's not my business. Mm -hmm. I will focus on the high road. But also then there's a protective mechanism, you know, in spiritual life, right? Mm -hmm. If there's someone coming who actually means harm, we have to protect ourselves with. And I think we're right. There's many leaders, you mentioned the two, they meant harm mm -hmm. to themselves and others. So this is where we don't have those global protective mechanisms against that. Mm -hmm. Democracy was supposed to, but it does to some extent, but clearly not enough as we need. Although you could say it's success, Mr. Zuma left, and let's see what happens in the US next. Mm -hmm.
in my first interview in this series, I interviewed a psychologist, Garrett Barnwell, and we found ourselves reflecting on the experiences of Viktor Frankl, who, as you know, survived the Nazi concentration camps. He survived with a 1 in 30 chance, and he attributed that to having exercised choice. And he said between stimulus and response is always a space for choice. No matter how much people try and collapse and restrict your freedom, and in the process of choosing, they're both therefore finding meaning. Now, I'm saying that to really honor you too, because I do sense that you're someone that who shows a similar sort of humility as you seek to invite people to find their own core metaphor and work out their own story and their own transformational narrative. Well, what opportunities do you see latent within this COVID-19 crisis for us to take home? I go back to the narrative. I say, okay, what's your metaphor of your life and your future? Operate from that story. And then part two is what's my zone of control, my zone of influence? I don't try to in futures get people, you can change everything because I don't think that's true. So really, I ask people, find out what, what's your metaphor of your life now? If COVID-19 is impacting you, what's your new metaphor? Does that story work for you? If it's helping you stay with it, if it doesn't work, rethink that story, then find evidence in the empirical world to support you in that, in your community. If the old story now has been shot, stop it. That's a used future. Get rid of it. Start working on your new story. I was just reading this one piece by someone who he wrote a chapter in one of our books, and he always thought himself as healthy, and then he saw his diabetes results. And then he realized his metaphor was eating chicken. And now his new metaphor became fighting chicken. He's going to fight for his life. Mm. And that, you know, that makes sense for him. And so then he came, okay, what does that mean? Monitor his health, monitor his eating patterns, exercise. So within his framework, this made sense. So I'm always very hesitant to prescribe, here's what people should do. What I've learned is people to go within, find what your story is, if it's working great, if it's not, how do I transform that? And you know, we're seeing the external world is a great reflection of that. But we go back to how you started this, COVID-19 is a disease, that could be narrative one. COVID-19 could be also a message. If you go to now a non-scientific view, right? From a psycho-spiritual view, what is the message it's giving me, it's giving all of us, what do we need to change? Mm. And maybe the message is nothing for some people. It's like, okay. <laughs> but, I mean, there's no prescription there. <laughs> Just a comment on your needed pause scenario. Coincidentally, a few months ago, before the COVID-19 crisis erupted, I discovered another kindred spirit who I'm now hoping to interview somebody from Nigeria, Bayom Akumalafe, to spread around the globe and see what he has to say. But the, what really got my attention, he has this mantra which says, the times are urgent, we need to slow down. Obviously rather counterintuitive, but it resonates marvelously with your needed pause scenario. And you're saying we don't need to slow down so that we can speed up. We need to slow down, find a new mantra, a mantra which is a more moving from simply a rationality to a, to a modality of, ex, of, of engagement. So what is the new mantra we need to find in the midst of this pandemic? The mantra process in our narrative foresight work, there's one a metaphorical process. Here's my story today, right? And then you think, well, you will find the better metaphor. But the act of the better metaphor is still coming from a rational self. It could be the high achiever self. I want a better metaphor to optimize profit. <laughs> so this is when we go to the mantra part. You take people to a very quiet space and you link the mantra with the metaphor and allow emergence. So this one monk, Dada Prana, invented that. Is the mantra emerges from your deepest self, a deepest part of you. It's a sound, a sacred sound. I've had secular people say, okay, in that process, they just say breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. And then at that moment, the old man, the old metaphor and the word, the sacredness meet and something new emerges. That emergence doesn't come from, let's say, the ego, the push yourself. 
it comes from a different part of who we are. And that becomes our new direction that pulls us forward. And complexity, chaos, language, that's a strange attractor that coheres where we need to go. And that can't be predicted and is different for every person. So this for us becomes the unexpected future. And it emerges from a different self. And when I've done that, it's always quite surprising. I never know quite what's going to emerge. And I look at it, aha, here's my inner self giving me a message how I can change. Well, gosh, I don't know about anybody who's going to see this interview, but I can certainly, from my point of view, say to you, in the Sahel, this has been extraordinarily helpful to me. And thank you so much. Uh, what comes to mind is, and I see in your writing, you also refer to Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. In writing my book, I was learning how to write a good book and it was introduced to that and said any, any story needs to follow that same basic uh, patterning. And I've seen it also now simplified a little bit. It says the first stage of the hero's journey of the place of the mundane and home is a place of order. And then there needs to be a move to, if we're going to grow and develop into a crossing of a threshold into a disorder. And it's in that disorder stage where we get lost and we need mentors and we need people to help us along the way so that we can push forward, push into the future. And there's an inflection point that happens when the curve of disorder suddenly becomes a curve up again into a reorder. That often comes when people find themselves at the entrance of the dark cave. And as a social worker and as a counsellor and helping people, I can tell them that you can only help you to get to the entrance of the cave. You've got to go in that cave yourself. And I can't give you any recipe or guarantee, but my experience has taught me from seeing a lot of other people going through their own journeys, that when you emerge, and you will, if you have faith, hope, courage, etc., there will be an elixir, there will be something that you have to share. Your narrative would have come into clarity again and you would be able to go back home. Even though it might be a familiar place, it'll be a different place because you're a different person. I like that. The elixir from the cave, it's beautiful. Mm, good. Jaws narrative, I love it, thank you. <laughs> Another thought which came to me, somebody said, a spiritual writer said, you need to find your own center of gravity. Otherwise, you're going to be sucked into somebody else's orbit. Thank you. I think that's beautiful. You're thinking through, here's the future I want. Am I living that story? Am I living someone else's story? And that's part of creating your gravity. If I'm in my authentic space, you're in your authentic space, then we're hoping it's more likely to create a more authentic world. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.